sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. <laughs> Jesus said to the twelve, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. <coughs> this is the Gospel of the Lord. God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day, through Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, since our gospel lesson is only two verses long, short and sweet, I figured the sermon should be short and sweet, too. I don't think there will be too many objections. Maybe, I don't know. After all, we got strawberries waiting, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a whole school of uh, public speaking, is that keep it simple. You know, keep it simple. How, it used to be back in the day, uh, 60 years ago, they taught, they, they taught preachers that you needed a seven-point sermon. Seven points and a poem was kind of the formula. Maybe some of you remember those days when sermons had those seven, but then it was reduced to three. Three points and a poem. So make your first, second, third point, and then, you know, wrap it up with some nice little poem kind of thing. I was taught one point. <laughs> I think we're getting dumber. We can't handle that much. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the case or what. But the idea is that less, less is sometimes more. Less is more, and if there's a single point, then you're more likely to remember that and be able to take that with you. So rather than overwhelming you with all these different ideas, one point. That's what Jesus is doing today. We have this simple reading with one point, and it is this. When you welcome Jesus, you welcome his friends. That's the one point. When you welcome Jesus, you welcome his friends. And that sounds great. Sure, I want to welcome Jesus. Jesus was amazing. I, you know, in scripture it talks about whenever he came into somebody's presence, their life was better after that. I mean, these people were magically healed. They were miraculously recovered from, from these terrible situations. He had this calming presence that anxieties would melt away. He could even calm the storms. I want to welcome Jesus. I want that kind of calming presence in my life. When you welcome Jesus, you welcome his friends. Okay, great, his friends. Well, we're all friends of Jesus, right? We can welcome one another. That sounds great. We'll keep reading the scripture and look at who Jesus' friends really are. It sounds all nice and good to welcome the friends of Jesus until you start putting some things together and realize that Jesus' friends were the beggars on the street corner, prostitutes, tax collectors, people of questionable moral character, people who were known to be corrupt. And he had dinner with them. That was one of the things that Jesus was accused of, hanging out with the wrong crowd, going to the wrong side of the tracks, as they say. His friends were not always the people that we might expect would be the friends of the Messiah, God made flesh. When you welcome Jesus, you welcome his friends. They're not just words spoken to, to us so that we might feel, and that's important, that we know that we are included in this message of hope. That we know that each one of us here today, that you know that God's word of hope, of God's grace, that it is yours, that it is for you. You are welcomed into the house and the family of God. It's important that you hear that. But it's not just spoken to you. It's spoken to people who aren't here, too. People who very much need that message of hope. And so it begs that question, as we are gathered in the name of Jesus, how do we practice that welcome? And that's one of the things I love about Highland is I think we do a pretty good job of hospitality, especially around weddings, memorial services, big occasions when a family needs uh, some support, especially memorials, when they're going through a hard time, going through 
a period of grief, that our congregation can come together and create a, a caring environment. Make sure that the flowers are put out on the table, the tablecloths are ironed. It's a lot of work to do that sort of thing. And I hope that we practice that same kind of welcome on Sunday mornings too. I think we generally are pretty good. I like to try to check in with visitors and guests and uh, during our coffee hour and, and uh, make sure to have a chance to talk. And as often as not, somebody else is already talking to them, so that's great. Keep that going. Keep that up. But, you know, that's the easy part, doing it here at church. The question is whether we practice that same kind of kindness when we leave this place. When we don't have a whole room full of people that are... Uh, try to do the same kind of good work when we're on our own. When you welcome Jesus, you welcome his friends. You welcome them outside of the church as well. <clears throat> welcome was not a simple matter in Jesus' day. Today it's, you know, I think it's, uh, I heard this really funny thing on the radio. If you listen to Kink at 5 p.m., they do this, uh, or 5.30, they do a comedy half hour. There was a comedian talking about how times have changed. That 50 years ago, if your doorbell rang, we've got company. And everybody was excited. The whole family would get up and go to the door. It's company. Thanks for coming. Come on in. Everybody would stop what they were doing. And company was a wonderful thing. Mom would say, now I can get the special coffee cake. Uh, that Entenmann's that she was saving all week told the family, don't touch the Entenmann's. That's for company if we should have anyone stop by. And the comedian was saying, today, it's a very different story. <laughs> today, when the doorbell rings, more often people are diving for the closets and hiding. Don't turn off the lights. Don't let them know we're here. <laughs> Talked about doing the army crawl across the floor to get away from the windows. <laughs> we're a very different culture today. And I think, uh, I don't know, I could probably make some comment about social media. And that's, you know, we're connecting through Facebook and online, so we don't need to worry about stopping in to personally check up on each other. But there is a cultural difference, a cultural shift. And honestly, I think we've lost some of our sense of that hospitality, some of that kind of welcome, some of that personal engagement that Jesus is encouraging. When we talk about welcome in our culture and society today, I don't know, I think of the greeters at Walmart. You know, it's nice, it's a hi, you know, but it's not really essential. In Jesus' day, that welcome was critical. It was a matter of life and death. And when Jesus talked about welcoming people, this was a very serious thing. Hospitality is still, in the Middle East, one of the most uh, important uh, practices that's observed. Have you ever thought about that verse in, uh, in Psalm 23? Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. I always thought that was a, an interesting... You prepare a table in, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Well, those, those are actually related to hospitality. The preparation of a table and the anointing with oil. There are five traditional acts of hospitality that re, were required for a guest once that person crossed the threshold into your home. Five different things that you were required to do once that person was uh, invited into your home. There are these. First of all, offer a drink of water. Think about ancient world. Uh, it's the desert. It's hot. It's dry. Of course, a drink of water. First thing, drink of water. Here you go. Number two, washing the feet of the guest. <coughs> Apparently in the ancient world, that was the second thing you do is wash their feet. So when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, it was an act of hospitality. He was welcoming, welcoming them, in essence, into his care by saying, I am the host, and you are my guests here, and let me take care of you and make sure that you've got what you need. Let me practice this hospitality here. Number three, greeting the guests with a kiss. Letting them know that they are uh, greeted warmly. Greeting them with a kiss. Number four, anointing or washing the head. Anointing is a fancy word for uh, a little bit of oil, pouring a little bit of oil on there. And again, I'm thinking the Middle East, hot, dry. Even this time of year doing more gardening, my hands get really dried out. You know, you need a little moisturizer. But imagine being in the desert, how much drier it gets. That oil, maybe on the scalp or even on the hands, uh, maybe even on the feet, but especially that, uh, that anointing on the head, that was an important act of hospitality. And number five, here for Highland, offer them something to eat. <laughs> maybe shortcake. I don't know. 
But those are all part of what hospitality means. What it means to welcome people in the ancient world. This description of hospitality is uh, of the desert people. If I were being pursued by an enemy and I came to your camp and I said, can I, can I stay here? You were bound to say yes. I mean, you, you, you pretty much couldn't say no. Now, the amazing thing here, once I'm in your camp, I'm under your care. And if somebody's after me, uh, you have to defend me while I'm in your camp. But the rule of the day was that I can't help but pick, imagine, I'm, I'm envisioning this, imagining the, the cowboys, you know, sitting around and playing a harmonica by the fire. And, you know, so you've got a ring of firelight and the rest of the area is dark. The enemy had to stay outside the ring of firelight, had to stay out in the dark for two nights and a day. So if I got there late in the evening and there was a fire burning, that's the first night. You get a full another day, a full campfire again, and then the next day. That's how long the rule was before uh, that enemy could pursue you into the circle. You figure that's a long time. You gotta have a pretty determined pursuer to wait that long, in the dark. You imagine they would get hungry, get frustrated, and maybe realize that they don't need to be so upset with you. And maybe it's more important to warm up and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm no longer after you. Is there any chance I can get something to drink and enjoy your fire with you? That's transformation. That's how this hospitality can change a situation of conflict into one of peace. And that pursuer would no longer be after your hide. <clears throat> I've talked before how there are uh, biblical scholars who um, look at the sociology, look at the culture of uh, Jesus' day, and try to figure out from a cultural standpoint um, what's going on in the scriptures. Here's one of the things they said. To welcome a person means to show hospitality. Hospitality is a process by means of which a stranger is taken under the protection of a host or patron for a given time, and to leave that protection either as a friend or an enemy. I thought that was the craziest thing, that even enemies can practice hospitality. Even enemies can show each other this basic level of kindness. I may not love you, but you're welcome to stay here. I thought that was pretty fascinating, thinking of you know, some of the kind of conflicts that we feel, especially family is great and terrible, and family is often the folks that we have the hardest time with. I think just about every family has conflict at one time or another, differing opinions, different personalities, clashing, inheritances, those kind of things can really divide people. But this lesson reminds us that even when we have those differences, it's important to find a way to share a meal or to show kindness. We can still disagree with each other and be kind that's kind of a novel concept for some. But that's what the scriptures are talking about here. And thinking back to Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's where that comes from. That even enemies can share a table. And you anoint my head with oil. Again, one of those symbolic uh, steps of showing hospitality. So it really begs the question, what's changed that hospitality has become such a rarity in our culture? There are individuals that are phenomenal. And if you've been to a, a home where people are really good at showing hospitality, you know what an amazing feeling that can be. If you ever travel and go to a bed and breakfast, the, uh, one or two times I've stayed at B&Bs, amazing hosts. And it feels a little awkward being in somebody's space, being in their home that you don't know real well. But when they start having conversation and letting you know how welcome you are, that's an amazing and to think that God does that with us in his home. Prepares an amazing meal. That God has a space, space especially prepared for each and every one of us. For all eternity. That's pretty incredible. I think it's a, a cultural challenge because in a, I, I think capitalism sometimes is a, a challenge. That you fight for your own, you, you, uh, you work for what you have. And that's kind of the opposite of hospitality.
there's that other side that it takes a village. The African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And right now I'm kind of glad that you're all here, that we have a village. Uh, but I think all of us, whether we're raising a child or whether we're just trying to get through our week, that we need community. That's part of what the church is all about, being able to come together and saying, I got a situation I can use a hand with, anybody available. Showing up to move furniture, or prepare a meal, or just sit together and visit. We all need that. And the challenge this week is to remember that one simple point. When we welcome Jesus, we welcome his friends. And this week, as we welcome Jesus into our lives by giving thanks for God's gifts, by enjoying the blessings of this season, we also able to have the courage to welcome his friends. The friends of Jesus who may not be welcome to many other places. May God give us the grace and the courage to show this kind of kindness 